All right, you guys, this is the last video lecture from me for the whole school year. I know some of you are just cheering, cheering, cheering. So let's look here at this introduction to the Cold War and how these superpowers are going to face off. So we do have our original three sitting here. We have Churchill, Roosevelt, and we have Stalin. Now on this particular slide, you're going to see this is a lot of the information that we had at the end of World War II when we looked at the conferences. So this is just really a repeat of that stuff. So we do know that it's going to be the Americans, the Soviet Union, and Great Britain who will have to unite in order to take down the Germans. Um, but we also know that there's going to be issues um, of how they're going to reestablish Europe and what that's going to look like in the view of the U.S. and the Soviet Union. We know in February 1945 that the big three uh, met at Yalta and decided how they were going to divide up Germany into their four occupied zones and that the way the Soviets saw that Germany will have to compensate them for this war. So for the zone that they were in charge of, they're going to strip them of all their resources and use them however they see fit as compensation for what had happened to them during World War II. And we know that the Soviet Union also said that they would be willing to help us against Japan. Big issue, will there be free elections in Eastern Europe? Soviet Union, Stalin says, yes, I will have uh, free elections in Eastern Europe, although this was a clash at Tehran between Churchill and Stalin, and we know it's going to be a clash again between Stalin and um, Truman when we get to Potsdam. Now, for my lovely individual in second period who says, ah, oh, nothing happened in the Cold War because they had all those weapons and didn't use them, that person is correct. So here's just a political cartoon looking at the Cold War in a nutshell. Um, there were a lot of nuclear weapons where each side was building up. And the goal here is to deter the other side from attacking. When you really look at the arsenal of nuclear weapons that the United States builds up versus what's gonna be built up by the Soviet Union, in actuality, when the two are fighting each other, we are not using those nuclear weapons. We are finding other ways to go after one another. Uh, we're going to be in involved in proxy wars. So yes, a lot of stuff happened in the Cold War, but we did not use nuclear weapons, which is what they were building up to do. They decided not to because if one would use them, the other would retaliate and use their weapons. So instead, we found other ways to go after each other. So this I know is not in your um, packet for your guided notes, but I wanted to include the percentages agreement because it's something I found, you know, it's kind of silly uh, regarding Churchill and Stalin. This is something they actually put down on a napkin. They had met in Moscow in October 1944, and they did this without Roosevelt being present. And these two had um, sat down and wrote this on a napkin discussing how they were going to split up different regions. So in Romania, Russia would have 90% influence. So you're kind of looking here at their influence, their spheres of influence. So the type of government, or, or I'm sorry, the government they would have, type of economy. So you would find communism in areas a little bit stronger and more capitalism in others, depending on how they split it up. So Romania, 90% influenced by Russia, 10% by the others. Greece, 90% by the United Kingdom, along with the US. So Churchill is attaching the United States to oversee areas that we are not even aware of in 1944. Yugoslavia, they've agreed to split it 50-50. Hungary, 50-50. And Bulgaria, 75% 
would have influence from the Soviet Union and then 25% for the United Kingdom and the, and the United States. So what I find interesting, you know, here these two have come together. They are secretly deciding how they're going to split up these areas, write it on a napkin, and then they argue over who's going to keep the evidence because not neither of them wanted the evidence because Roosevelt wasn't present. Roosevelt would not have agreed to this. And the fact that they've assigned the United States to oversee some of these areas. And we'll see how we actually do get sucked in. So this percentages agreement in 1944 was a little behind the scenes. And what I find a little interesting is that then Churchill wants to act surprised when the Soviet Union does take influence in Romania, does have influence in Hungary and in Bulgaria. It's like, what are you talking about? You put it on paper. You knew what this man was going to do with it. He's going to take charge. So we also had looked at uh, Churchill and Roosevelt in the Atlantic Charter had said that they needed to have an organization that can oversee things, particularly after the war. And uh, what they ended up creating was the United Nations. And it is an international organization of, uh, at that time, 50 states. You know, the United Nations has grown. It is still in practice today. Its goal was to maintain peace and non-aggression. Uh, there are five permanent members. And this was something we had talked about in um, our conferences for the end of World War II. So our five permanent members, Great Britain, China, France, the United States, and the Soviet Union. Um, there are a lot of things that the United Nations is involved in, and one of those areas is that they do continue to help with humanitarian aid around the world and assist when there are world conflicts. And sometimes they assist by um, providing troops to just protect people, and there could be instances where they provide troops to actually engage in warfare. Um, you know, unlike the League of Nations, where there were no troops, they didn't have a military to back them up, the United Nations does. Members of the United Nations uh, volunteers or designate so many of their troops, uh, their military to assist in the conflicts. However, you can always say, no, I'm not going to engage in this conflict because you're going after my ally or <laughs> okay, you're coming after me. So then I'm not going to participate in this. Um, looking further into the United Nations is going to be a, an option for someone uh, for our project. So looking at the differing between the United States and the Soviet Union's goals, um, clearly we are on opposite ends of the spectrum. And we know when we looked at communism and capitalism and the Industrial Revolution Unit that they oppose each other, that for communism to succeed, capitalism has to be gone. So having those differing goals definitely puts us at odds with one another. For the communists or for the Soviet Union, they want communism. For the United States, we are capitalism and democracy. And, and when you look at the Soviet Union, their idea of communism also brings in that totalitarian regime, which is completely opposite of what we're looking at here in our own country. How are they viewing um, Eastern Europe? How are they viewing you know, Europe in general? For the Soviet Union, they're going to use Eastern Europe to help with their industrialization. So they're going to use their resources. They're going to use their people. The US views them as, yeah, we can get access to raw materials, but also open up new markets between you know our nations uh, and then when you look at the soviet union they're going to okay want to control eastern europe and prevent any kind of western influence and we saw that in the video on the berlin airlift where for stalin that whole idea of combining that currency and combining those sectors of the french the british and the american side of of berlin and even within germany that was a threat. And he said that communism cannot survive with 
capitalism that close by. For the United States, it was we need to rebuild European governments. You know, we need to have these governments, these countries on friendly terms because we need to get those markets back open to help build economically. Because we saw after World War II that the economic strain, I'm sorry, after World War I, that economic strain on those countries led to the rise of dictators. So let's not create that situation again. Let's help them build. For the Soviet Union, they need to keep Germany divided. Um, they have to keep them divided so that they cannot be a strong nation and engage in warfare again. I mean, we also have to understand the Soviet Union did take a very heavy brunt from the Germans during World War II. I mean, they suffered greatly. And, you know, with that turning point, they fought with all their might to push the Germans back. For the United States and Great Britain's also in this mindset that they have to reunite Germany. That's the only way that you can create a stable Germany and build them up economically again, and it will help to stabilize Europe as well. So the Iron Curtain. Um, we said that the Soviet Union kept saying, Stalin says, I need a buffer, I need a buffer, I need a buffer. And that's what Eastern Europe is supposed to be. You know, World War II is over and he still wants a buffer. He says, look at the devastation done to my land, I need a buffer. So if anything happens, it happens out there. So this idea that they are still fearing this invasion from the West because of what had happened, still present. And what they're planning on doing and what they end up doing once they had um, liberated Eastern Europe was to actually turn it into satellite nations. So these nations that had governments just like theirs that answered to Moscow, they created these satellite nations. So remember the whole issue over free elections in Eastern Europe. And at first he said, no, I don't want free elections. And then he agrees to free elections and then they get to Potsdam and he's like, no, not having free elections. And Truman says, yes, you are. Well, we didn't exactly break down how those free elections needs to happen. And this is where he brings in what's known as the salami tactics, where, you know, when you get salami and you slice off piece by piece. And I have someone in another class said, hey, but salami's good. That's crazy. Well, they call this salami tactics where stage one, uh, the Soviets supervise like an organization of governments in Eastern Europe that are anti-fascist and would embrace communism. And then stage two, you start to pick off the parties one by one. And then once you have the core of the communist group left, then it is Moscow trained people that you put in charge of those countries. And one particular country that this took place in was Poland. And remember, Poland, the deal was they were supposed to have a coalition government where you had communists and non-communists. Uh, but he says, no, it can't co you can't coexist if you have communists and capitalists in the same area. So in Poland, one of the things they did to have their free elections is that before the elections in uh, 1947, they had a campaign of murder, censorship, and intimidation. Uh, over 50,000 people were deported to Siberia before they hold the, held the election. Just in case anyone wanted to like not support his Moscow trained people. And then... When people showed up to like vote, then they discovered you're not registered to vote. So the only people that they wanted were the ones from Moscow. So yes, they held elections. They just weren't free the way we would define free elections where they eliminated people. They said you weren't registered. They sent you to Siberia or they just killed you. But they held their elections and they were able to get their Moscow trained communist in the government. So Soviets control over Eastern Germany and half of Berlin, we saw this um, in our video. And by the time we get to March of 1946, Winston Churchill is not the prime minister. 
And we saw that at Potsdam where he went there and then his party lost the election. So he was no longer prime minister. And I said, like, you need to come back home. Well, on March 5th, 1946, he was in Missouri and he gave this speech called the Iron Curtain speech. And Her President Harry S. Truman was there and pretty much Churchill is using this moment to pretty much get President Truman to do his bidding with Stalin, to get rid of communism and Stalin. And he's kind of using some scare tactics. So I'm gonna share part of uh, his speech where he says, from the Shetin in the Baltic to the Trieste and the Adriatic, an iron curtain has descended across the continent. Behind the line lie all the capitals of the ancient states of Central and Eastern Europe. And then he ventures on and talks about how, I do not believe that the Soviet Russia desires war. What they desire is the fruits of war and the indefinite expansion of their power and doctrines. Our difficulties and dangers will not be removed by closing our eyes to them. They will not be removed by mere waiting to see what happens, nor would they be relieved by a policy of appeasement. Boy, he is pulling out all the stops. He's not pulling any stops on these guys. But he continues to build up how really it's Western democracies need to stand together and strict adherence to the principles of the United Nations Charter and that they need to stop them. They need to keep Europe liberated. You know, he is playing right into that hostility that Truman has towards Stalin. And we already know that Churchill is great with his speech or speeches. You know, he has inspired his nation. So now he is inspiring Truman to make it his mission to stop the spread of communism. And Truman does take the bait. He is going to set up a doctrine to stop the spread of communism. So I do wanna point out for anyone who's thinking, oh my goodness, an iron curtain actually came down. No, it did not. And this is also not that Berlin wall, just a metaphor. So the fact that now there's part of Europe and we have it over here on the map and you can see what would be known as the Iron Curtain, that these are countries that have now been cut off from the rest of Europe, that they are under communist control. Now you'll see that Yugoslavia, it is a communist nation, but this is under Tito and he will not answer to Moscow. They will establish a communist nation and Tito is also going to point out uh, they didn't need Stalin's help to push the Germans out. So they're not answering to Moscow like the other countries will be forced to do so. Um, but it's just that these are countries that I had mentioned prior, they had fallen under Nazi occupation. They were liberated by the Soviet Union. They are not gonna be able to rejoin the rest of Europe. They are not going to live a liberated life until we see the collapse of the Soviet Union in the late 80s and early 90s. So let's look at some of this foreign policy, how it's going to increase tensions. We establish what's known as the containment policy. And it's our foreign policy that we're going to completely use throughout the war, Cold War, to say that, you know, we are going to stop the spread of communism. We are going to isolate it. We're going to contain it in a region and not allow it to seep anywhere else. And this policy is what's going to take us around the world to actually get involved in a lot of proxy wars to stop the spread of communism. Uh, because if that means we are going to support dictators to stop communism from seeping into the country, then that's what we do, which then becomes a problem with how people view the United States. So as I mentioned, Truman comes up with his doctrine, which he is going to stop the spread of communism and that's through the Truman Doctrine. Uh, we will provide aid to any country that comes under uh, outside pressure or aggression to accept communism. 
And we see this as a problem that the Soviet Union is really trying to influence areas. And, and one of the places that seems to be under attack is Greece. Now, when you look at what's happening in Greece, remember, in that percentages agreement, Churchill attached us to be the protectors of Greece with them. Well, we find out that we are supposed to help protect Greece when Great Britain says, oh, we can't financially do this any longer. So you're going to have to step in and stop communism from taking over because there was a revolution that had erupted and Turkey was also unstable at that time. So this is established in order to stop the spread of what was going on within Greece and Turkey. But it becomes a doctrine that takes us throughout the world. And in a way, we still have that mentality that came with the Truman Doctrine that we become, the United States becomes the police for the rest of the world. Because instead of communism now in 2021, it's terrorism, that we will police the world of terrorist activities. Uh, all that fear, that domino theory that things would just fall. You know, if one nation fell in that region, then the other ones would fall right along with them. One of the things that we offer, and uh, we were a little sneaky about this, uh, the Marshall Plan, that we are going to offer uh, financial support to try to help rebuild any European country. And we even say, hey, Soviet Union, you can get some money too. The deal was all of their financial books, all of those governments had to copies of their financial books to the United States government. We knew that the Soviet Union would not accept that. So then they wouldn't accept our offer. Um, and at first, this was a hard sell to get past our Congress. You know, that's a, a lot of money, $13 billion. Uh, but what's actually going to help is the fact that the Soviet Union will go in and, um, and attack Czechoslovakia. So, when they go after Czechoslovakia, then this passes, and now we're going to focus on helping rebuild uh, Western Europe. We had looked at the Berlin airlift uh, in our video this week. So the splitting of Germany into those four occupied zones, the blockade because the Soviets were completely against it and they held Berlin pretty much uh, as hostages, and that's the Berlin that was controlled by the, by the French, the British, and the American zones. And we have right here in our map to see where it's strategically located right inside the Soviet bloc. And we know that the airlift was very successful, but, you know, after for so long, it's like, how much longer? We could just keep doing this forever. We're going to have to just back off and, and move forward. Uh, the Soviet Union is the one that will say, let's negotiate, let's figure this out because that was a no win situation. It was just going to continue on. Uh, but then just within a couple of years, they then have access to the atomic bomb, which then we are no longer holding that over them, having that power. So the Cold War, it is going to divide the world, and the impact is, is it's going to dictate the American and Soviet foreign policy for half a century. You know, who's involved, what's going on, when, where. You know, some of you may choose to do some of the proxy wars, like the Korean War, the Vietnam War, um, you know, in order to look at how that's going to impact their foreign policy and what goes on within those wars. Rival alliances will be created and we'll have NATO and we'll also have the Warsaw and then the counter will be the Warsaw Pact. NATO has 10 Western nations that aligned with the United States and Canada. It is a military defense. And we had this established in response to that Berlin blockade. So we knew early on, yep, we are going to need a military alliance in case something happens and we would have to go to war with uh, the Soviet Union and their satellite nations. So the Soviet Union establishes the Warsaw Pact. And that's something that um, you go back, they go back and forth. One creates a program, the other one counters it. One creates an alliance, the other one counters it. They too have a military defense, 
Uh, but this is going to come up after the construction of the Berlin Wall. So that's going to fall under a different uh, Soviet premier, not under Stalin. Stalin passes away in 1956. Nuclear war and space race. So some of you may choose to look at the arms race, while others might choose to look at the space race uh, for your project. So the Soviet Union explodes its first atomic weapon in 1949. So that is four years after we explode what we had. So up until that point, our government had that power over them. So the moment they have the capability and they are successful with it, gloves are off. Let's have this competition. You know, they end up with the hydrogen bomb, both nations in 1943, and we get to the point of brinkmanship. And, you know, we're constantly dealing with each other where we're like pushing each other almost to the verge of war. But with this building up of weapons, then we go back to that first political cartoon where it's like, ooh, do we really want to use that stuff? Because let's talk about how devastating this is going to be if we start to release these, you know, atomic weapons. Because when the United States had released those two during uh, World War II, after the war, we said, all right, no other nation can have an atomic weapon. No other nation could have a nuclear weapon. And the other countries were like, whoa, no, 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 no. That can't be because if we're supposed to be working together, you have the upper hand. So the Soviet Union was like, nope, we're going to get that as well. We also end up in a space race, getting unmanned satellites up into, you know, into the sky there. The Soviets launched Sputnik in 1957, and this may be, a, you know, a piece that someone wants to research for their project. We start to feel that we are behind in that technology, and this is where you start to see in education a lot of money going into science and math. And so we see money being fed into tech and science programs, and then we launch uh, in 1958. We also start to see a lot of espionage. So on that, um, you know, when you start to look at the different presidents, some are going to be very active where we will engage in warfare and others are going to be like, let's do espionage. Let's have spies. Let's play the game. And here we have the U.S. starts to spy on the Soviet Union. And unfortunately, our U-2 spy plane is uh, going to be discovered. And then that's going to lead to some issues between um, our two nations. And someone may choose to investigate the U-2 spy planes. So here we have a little cartoon uh, looking at the Cuban Missile Crisis where we have Kennedy and Khrushchev um, <clears throat> sitting here on the nuclear weapon because you have Cuba that um, has had issues with the United States and someone might want to look into what was going on in Cuba during that time with their revolution and then being pulled into the side of the Soviet Union with communism. That can also be a project topic. But you have here Khrushchev and Kennedy at odds with one another. The Soviet Union is going to put missiles in Cuba directed toward us not what we want to hear, not what we want to see. And then that threat, you know, who's going to blink? Who's going to win this one? Um, in the end, the United States is able to get the Soviet Union to not have missiles in Cuba pointed our way. For Khrushchev, that's going to cost him his job. I mean, he had already, you know, lost the issue of what was going on uh, in Berlin and problems economically between West Berlin and East, East Berlin and then West Germany and East Germany because it's as easy, it was as easy as just walking across the street or walking in one building and to the other side out the back door to get into the free zone within Germany and within Berlin. Um, so they felt that we had made a mockery of Khrushchev too many times in the Soviet Union and Cuban Missile Crisis is pretty much going to be his downfall. And then we're going to get Brezhnev. And Brezhnev wants to act like Stalin. What I included in this last slide, just so you can see here, uh, all the dates from 1945 all the way down to 1990. 
and um, the presidents on the side for the United States, and then the Soviet premiers over here on the right, and then the different stages of the Cold War. So the beginning with Truman and Stalin, and then the shift to Asia, where we kind of just let Europe go the way that it, it has fallen. I mean, Czechoslovakia, we didn't, no one saved them from Hitler, and they're not saved from the Soviet Union either. Uh, so now the shift is going to be, we're going to focus on what's going on in Asia and all throughout. We start to see a little bit of a thaw, uh, new leaders, new ideas, uh, China and the Soviet Union not necessarily on the same page anymore. We have Eisenhower and Khrushchev. Khrushchev came in to de-Stalinize Russia. And so our government thought that would be great. Someone not like Stalin, but he only shares that speech with his party. It's not shared publicly. It's not thrown out there for the world. Um, but he also behaves like Stalin when certain satellite nations are seeing an opportunity to maybe not necessarily end communism, but have their own communist leaders not attached to Moscow. He sends in the troops to crush them. And some of you may choose to go that route in your research. Uh, we end up with Kennedy and we see some issues here in Berlin and in Cuba. And this is where we start to get the Berlin Wall and we had to get the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, and then with each premiere after that Berlin Wall goes up, we start to see it even built even stronger to keep uh, people from going into West Berlin and keeping those people within there. And then all the way down through Reagan and Bush and Gorbachev and Yeltsin, where we start to see the end of the Cold War and that collapse of the Soviet Union. So that is it for this brief introduction over um, the Cold War, and hopefully some of you might choose some of these topics for your project.